Good morning. Oh, geez. It is good to have you with us here in this lovely August day, whether it is in person or online. We are happy you could join us this morning. Now, I was thinking about how I was pretty glad to be back at church and back with you guys to be in fellowship again. And I was reminded that uh, as much as I love being with you guys and being encouraged and spurred on, I was reminded of a song we sing at camp. I'm not going to sing it, otherwise you'll fully realize why I'm not on the worship team, but (laughs) it's from a psalm. It's from Psalm 121, and I'll just read it for you. It says this, I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He watches over you. He watches over you, will not slumber. Indeed, he watches over Israel, will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade and your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon. Nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over you, coming and going, both now and forevermore. The promises of the Lord hold true, and that's what we put our faith in. As much as it is nice to be in the building and be with you guys, My faith is still in God, and I hope yours is too. Would you pray with me as we open our service this morning? God, thank you that we can be together in some form or fashion, whether that's online or in person. Thank you that you developed the church as a community to support and love each other. We pray now for uh, the trials that are going on in our country and around the world. We pray for the families that are hurting from loss and those that are struggling with not knowing or being unable to be tested or those that have been tested and now struggle with the reality of what's to come. God, we pray for our leadership in our country, both here in Canada and around the world. There are no easy solutions right now, but we pray that you would continue to give them wisdom and strength as they lead us. We pray here at our church that you would continue to give our leadership wisdom and patience and kindness as we go through this trial on our own. I pray now for each of us here this morning that you would open our hearts and minds to the lessons that you have for us this morning, for the encouragement, perhaps rebuke, and that we would receive it well and allow it to affect the way in which we live for you in our day to day. Pray all these things in your name. Amen. Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome. Uh, We're excited to be here to worship, um, to praise God. Um, As I think and look and read the news and hear what's going on, I very often find that things seem hopeless. Um, we, We hear about, obviously, diseases and death and economic problems, and we have all kinds of things going on in our world that's just not good. And reading in Habakkuk chapter 3, he felt that too, and yet found reason to praise God. And we have even more reason to praise God. Let me read from Habakkuk, and then a little bit from 1 Peter. Um, Habakkuk 3 verse 16, I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior." The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Now, Habakkuk said all this still looking forward to Jesus. We have extra reason for hope. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 3, I'm just going to read a little bit here. This is fantastic. Praise be to God. 
Let's try that again. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Good morning. It is good to see everyone today. 
And uh, before I get to the announcements, I just wanted to just say uh, to be praying for the Chibai family today because at 3 o'clock uh, they are having uh, a little service here in, uh, in memory of their daughter and their son-in-law who uh, have passed and just be praying for all of those who are mourning uh, this great loss in their life. Um, also this week, we have uh, VBS that's starting tomorrow, and it's going to be happening in the evening time. I do encourage you to be praying for all of those who are involved, the families that are taking part, those who are leading VBS to be in prayer for them as, uh, as we just share the gospel message and share the power of Christ and uh, that he is worthy of our praise, just as uh, Jeremy had said before that song. Um, we need to uh, just be in prayer for, for this coming week and uh, for those maybe new commitments that might take place of those going, I want to serve the Lord. So be praying for anyone's uh, uh, first commitments. Uh, coming up on September 2nd at 7 o'clock, there's going to be a Leaders at the Gate uh, meeting. So if you have any questions or anything uh, that you would like to bring forward, you can bring it on September 2nd. Uh, also on Friday, every Friday, we have Celebrate Recovery, and uh, Celebrate Recovery starts at 7 o'clock. They do a bit of a larger group. They still follow all the social distance uh, rules, obviously, uh, and then they have a little bit of, a, um, uh, of their other open share groups that start at 8 o'clock. Now, with... Uh, with us talking about Celebrate Recovery, we are going to watch a video, an interview, a faith interview about one of the main leaders of CR, and uh, she has an amazing story, and uh, I hope that all of you um, truly hear uh, her life story and the amazing work that God has been doing in it. Let's Good morning, Park Meadows. Uh, I am here today with Carly Waldner. Uh, Mrs. Carolee Waldner, and uh, uh, she has uh, been very gracious to take some time. Good morning, Park Meadows. Uh, I am here today with uh, Carolee Waldner, uh, Mrs. Carolee Waldner, and uh, uh, she has uh, been very gracious to take some time away from her family this morning to come into town and uh, uh, do a bit of an interview with me. Um, once again, we want to take some time and learn uh, from uh, those who share faith and who have uh, uh, God's Spirit living within them and the things that they're learning. And so to have her here today is uh, really appreciated. So thanks for coming in, Carolee. So let's, uh, let's dive right in. Uh, this past year, you received a diagnosis. Uh, uh, you were diagnosed with a heart condition and informed that you would need to have some surgery at some point. Maybe you can start by refreshing our memory and uh, give us a bit of an update on your health as it stands. Yeah, I was diagnosed with both Parkinson White syndrome, and uh, it's a rare heart condition. It's not common. Um, uh, basically, it's kind of the opposite of what people would anticipate with a pacemaker. So with a pacemaker, your heart rate goes really low, and so a pacemaker raises your heart rate. My problem is sort of opposite. In a typical episode, my heart rate will accelerate. Um, mm. It can get as high as 220 beats per minute. So you can imagine that's a medical distress. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, when it initially happened, I didn't know what it was. Uh, so I called an ambulance, the paramedics came. Um, they needed medication to reset me. And uh, uh, so it was a really traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, then after the reset, the medication went to the hospital, the doctor explained what the condition was. And um, that basically it was, it was a long journey, it wasn't gonna be a short journey. And subsequent episodes kind of proved to me that yes, you know, my heart rate would accelerate. I had no control over when it would happen. It could be in the middle of the night, I would be awakened in my sleep. It could happen first thing in the morning. It could happen late in the evening. Um, it didn't seem to matter what activity I was doing. I, it would just happen at random. So that's the frustration that I have with the condition because I have absolutely no control over it. Um, the medical community has no control over when it's going to happen. Mm. Um, in, in subsequent episodes, I did um, 
you know, in education too, found out that there are ways to reset it. And so one ER doctor actually taught me a technique that I now use at home. Mm. So I only require one other person to be with me. And it's called a vagal maneuver. So it's basically just physical things that we do mm. to help the heart reset. And so since February, I haven't had to go back to the hospital for a reset. So when COVID hit, that was one of my biggest concerns. Right. Do I need to keep going back to the hospital? But God provided this maneuver mm. that I'm mm -hmm. able to do at home. Mm. And so that's kind of where things are at. So if I can ask, I know this isn't on the questions, we're already deviating. Um, so how long do the episodes last? Um, if, I mean, I feel them right away. The symptoms are sort of shortness of breath, tightening in the chest, yeah. um, and, and just, yeah, like it's, it's very evident when it happens. And so with this vagal maneuver, it only takes a couple of minutes okay. actually for the reset. Um, but when I was going to the hospital, it took a lot longer. Yeah. So. Yeah, I can appreciate that. So, yeah, thank you for sharing that. I, I mean, I can imagine, you know, they were traumatic in the beginning and even probably when you feel them coming on now, you know, there's probably an, uh, some measure of anxiety. Uh, so, so where does this leave you at this point? How has this affected life? Uh, what's next for you? Well, to permanently fix the problem, I need a surgical procedure called catheter ablation. So basically they go inside my heart and they find the nerves that are creating this circular electrical problem and they essentially burn them. Okay. Um, but uh, sadly, it's considered an elective surgery. Um, with each episode, I'm still conscious, I'm still alive. Um, it's very different than, say, something where someone would need a bypass or a stint. Okay. Um, so in the realm of cardiac surgery, bypass and stint surgery is ahead of me. And okay. mine is considered elective, only because I have access to these vagal maneuvers, I have access to resources in emergency rooms that can reset me. Mm. Um, the typical waiting list is eight months, um, but when COVID hit, that was about a four month time period that elective surgeries were canceled in Alberta. So I'm probably not looking at even getting a surgery date until 2021. Mm. And so is it fair to assume then, like, are you able to be driving at this point? Like, are, you, are there things in life that you've kind of had to put on hold? Well, one of, the, one of the things that I've struggled with most is really limiting my church involvement. Um, that was, I was working with the junior high youth. That one I had to let go of. I'm still um, participating in Celebrate Recovery. But again, I make sure that I have a driver with me. Like even now, my son is with me. Um, I really can't be left alone because mm. I need support from one other person with this technique. Mm. Or I'll need to call 911 and have an ambulance taken wow. to the hospital. So the schedule has really gotten small for a homeschooling mom with teenagers <laughs> that lives on a farm. <laughs> yeah, I, I can appreciate that would be an odd scenario. Uh, so in a recent email, um, you had mentioned to me, and I think the phrase you used were, was that you were learning a great deal during the season of waiting and waiting and waiting. Uh, do you mind sharing with us one or two of the lessons that you're learning? Sure. Um, the first lesson is, is just sort of generic in terms of faith and trust. Um, when I had my first episode, ironically, it was the morning that I was driving the junior high out to Camp Carillon. And so I mistook it for a panic attack. So immediately I started texting the other youth leaders and a few of my, my Christian friends and said, I'm having a panic attack, I need you to pray. And it took about an hour actually for that episode to resolve. I didn't know what it was at the time. Mm. But immediately the response that I got back um, from two different friends, one who was a youth sponsor and one who wasn't, was Psalm 4610. Mm. that says, be still and know that I am God. And those people didn't know each other, and they didn't know they had texted that Bible verse mm -hmm. at the exact same time. Mm -hmm. And I just, it was, uh, to me, evident that God is always at work. God can work through different people in the same circumstance and give you the same message. Mm -hmm. And so now whenever um, I'm in an episode, what I try to have go through my mind is just those two words, be still. Mm -hmm. Episodes are still scary mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I know who God is, I know that he's in control, and so when it begins to start, I also know that I can just put my faith and trust in him. Yeah. And so instead of an episode now being something to fear, it's amazing, God has used it to turn it into an act of worship. Mm. 
And to me, that's been comforting, and it has given me peace just to know, be still, mm. and God is with me in those very, um, mm. very scary moments. That's a huge gift. Yeah. That's, uh, and you, you mentioned one other thing, and, and um, when I was thinking about your question, I, I was just reflecting on the fact that um, going through a season of waiting is really tough. It's tough for anyone, but it's also tough as a believer. Mm. And, um, you know, there's people in the Bible that went through seasons of waiting. Moses waited 40 years before going back to Egypt, and, and David had to wait before he was actually king. Mm. And even Jesus waited until he was 30 years old um, before beginning his public ministry. So there's many Bible characters, like we're in this series of heroes of faith, mm. that went through seasons of waiting. And so I draw a lot of strength from their example in the scriptures that my season of waiting might only be one year, not 40 years, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? And, and God is good, he's carrying me through it. And, um, you know, another verse that I cling to is Psalm 27, 14. It says, wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. That one makes me laugh because <laughs> twice in one verse, it says, wait for the Lord. And in my life, I'm a get her done girl. Yeah. I'm a, hey, yeah. <laughs> it's, hey, let's get her done. And, and so for this to be, yeah, I've got to wait. I've got to wait for my surgery. I've got to wait even in the moments of, of resetting. Um, and yet, I, I give God that control. I don't have control over the wait list. I don't have control over which surgeon at which time it's going to be. Mm -hmm. But in the middle of that, God is asking me to wait. And he's asking me to wait patiently. Mm -hmm. And I'm not alone in that. You know, it's... it's God has given me an amazing support network of people within this church family um, that are just really walking alongside me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not alone in that waiting, and that's been a huge, huge gift of realization yeah. from God to me. Yeah, that's a, that's a grace for sure. So going forward, uh, how, uh, how best can Park Meadows walk with you? What does that look like for us to, to support you and your family? in this season of waiting and learning and uh, being still? <laughs> yeah, um, I would say prayer is the biggest support that my family can receive at this time. Um, you know, I'm able to carry on with most of my day-to-day -day tasks. When I asked my doctor, he said live. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm striving to do. Mm -hmm. um, but in the midst of that, I recognize that like my schedule has had to change. I've had to adjust. Um, you know, how much I can help people, I have to scale that back. Mm -hmm. And one of the greatest lessons has also been learning to listen to my husband when it comes to... I, you're smiling, but it's actually true. It's one of the hardest things for a wife to say, yes, dear, you're right, to her husband. <laughs> and, and yet, Jake has my best interests at heart. Mm -hmm. And I have really learned good lessons in humility mm. in going to him. Like even for this interview, I said, John, I'd like to do this interview. What do you think, Jake? Mm. And he was relieved it was a video first, mm -hmm. just in case. You know, and he said, take Andrew. You know, so communicating in my marriage has really improved. Mm. Um, you know, and, and so to just continue to pray for that, um, yeah. that Jake and I can communicate well, that my children um, are at peace at this time. Um, this is a big church. We don't always know each other. Mm. But in the bulletin, there's always a list of people who are struggling. Mm. And my name is there. And just like the little pair, you know, the little parentheses, heart. <laughs> and, but what's been neat is people will text me. People will email me. Um, I've got here two cards that I received from my church family. And it just says, you are being held up in prayer by your Park Meadows church family. Mm. And to me, things like cards, texts, emails, whether I know the person or not, I really appreciate that. It's these little things that, even though it's a big church, you yeah. can feel that you are being supported in prayer. And, and I just love that. And so my encouragement to other people who may be struggling like me is, be brave. Mm. Contact the church. Let Leslie know. Let you or James know. Mm. Let someone know that you need support, mm. especially in prayer. Um, because there is power in that, you know, it, it's better if we are together supporting one another. Yeah. Scripture tells us to carry each other's burdens. 
And to me, that's so important. And I'm thankful that this church family has done that for me. I know they will continue to do that for me. Um, but I just really want to encourage others to reach out and get the support and help that they need too. And that's part of why I wanted to do this interview, mm. is just to encourage others that you do not have to walk a tough road alone. As a church family, we're here to help. That is a good word, lady. Thanks so much. Uh, we are. Uh, we will definitely be continuing to pray for you. We pray f that the the season of waiting isn't as long as the doctors infer it might be. Um, but uh, but also thanking God that you're you're learning things in the in the season of waiting and uh, just being grateful that you're willing to share them with us so that we can grow as you grow. So God bless you. Thanks so much. Appreciate your time. Thanks, John. That was, interest, that was interesting to listen to. It's uh, a good reminder of what being a church is all about, especially in these different times. Please join me with in congregational prayer. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Thank you, Lord, for everything you have done for us. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. We are so thankful for the many blessings you have bestowed upon each of us. Forgive us for all our sins. Be the Lord of our lives. Create in us a clean heart and a right spirit within us. Renew our minds. Heal us from the hurts of our past. We love you and need you. Cover us with your precious and holy blood as well as our families, our friends, and our life projects. Lord, bless and protect everyone that seeks you, needs you, and believes in you. May our praises this morning bring you honor and glory. Throughout this week, we have done many things that were not pleasing to you. Lord, please forgive us for the wrongs that we have done. Lord, forgive us for letting things stand in the way of appreciating, loving, and enjoying the life you've given us. Help us make the most of every moment beginning today. Father, you have so graciously forgiven us. Help us today to forgive others who have wronged us. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promise I believe. O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Father God, we pray for those that are sick in our church. We pray, Lord, that you will place your hand of healing on Agatha Schmidtke, Rhea Friesen, Andy Reeves, Bonnie Lorian, Carol Lee Waldner. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that you will give her the waiting that peace in the waiting that she is doing now. And may the surgery come quickly. We also pray for Gabrielle Mamula, Josephine Kethler, and any others that may not have put their name forward. We also pray f for Harvey and Esther Berg's daughter, Jolene, who is undergoing radiation treatments. We pray, Lord, that this radical treatment will bring the desired results and bring Jolene back to full health. Lord, you know our every need, our every hurt. You have knit eat one, each one of us in our mother's wombs, and you know each one of us inside and out. We ask for healing of our bodies where there is sickness and pain. We pray for the families that have lost loved ones. We grieve along with the Chibai family who tragically lost two loved members of their family. We pray for the Bailey and Wenis families. They are grateful that Maureen is no longer in pain and is in the presence of the father. But now they need to find a new normal as the siblings all return to their homes. And in the same way, we pray for Marty Cadle and his family. We, too, are grateful that Marty's mom, Anne, is no longer in pain. And as sudden as Anne's death happened, we, too, are grateful that her struggle with pain is over and she is wrapped in the arms of her Heavenly Father. Just as I am, poor, wretched, blind, sight, riches, healing of the mind. Yes, all I need in thee to find, 
O Lamb of God, I come, I come. We pray for our Vacation Bible School for the coming week. We ask and hope that children may accept you as their personal Savior. And Lord, as we are searching to establish an elder team in this church, we pray for those who are currently being asked to be part of this team. We ask you to give each of the men wisdom as they search their hearts and reach out to you for the right answer. For all of those that have been asked, Lord, we pray that you would surround these men with grace. We pray that they would receive a double portion of trust in you, Lord. Lord, give both Pastor John and Pastor James a servant heart and a caring spirit for the whole body of Christ. May they both continue to grow in grace and show forth in their lives and homes a genuine love for those to whom they minister and a deep love for you, Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, who shows your love to all creation, we come before you asking for a quick control of the coronavirus currently ravaging our world. Hear graciously the prayers we make for those affected by the virus in various parts of the world. Grant healing to the sick and consolation to the bereaved families. We pray that an effective medicine to combat the sickness be speedily found. We pray for the relevant governments and health authorities that they take appropriate steps for the good of the people. Look upon us in your mercy and forgive us our failings. All good gifts come from you, dear Lord, and from these riches we bring this offering. Help us to use it for the furtherance of your purpose in this place and for the benefit of those in need. We ask that you give us a blessed Sunday. May we open our hearts and minds as we praise you in our time of worship and as we hear the message that you have guided Pastor John to tell us today. May your word dwell in our hearts and minds. May we draw ever closer to you, and we ask that you prepare us for the day that you will return, and we pray that you will come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, Park Meadows. And good morning, those out there in uh, internet land. It's good to, good to see you. Uh, and it's also good to see uh, my friend Raymond back again uh, to uh, translate once again for, uh, for our friends. And uh, uh, we're uh, really pleased to see that happening. And it looks like Raymond's family is here back from Montreal. So welcome home. He was kind of whiny when I saw him last with his wife and kids away for so, such a long time. So anyways, uh, it, it is good to be here. Uh, there's a story uh, not many people know about three hockey players uh, who were actually uh, in danger of being executed by firing squad. Uh, one played for the Vancouver Canucks, one played for the Calgary Flames, and the other played for the Toronto Maple Leafs. The guard brought the Vancouver player forward, lined him up, and the executioner asked if he had any last requests. He says no. And the executioner shouts, ready, aim, earthquake! yelled the Canuck. Everyone is startled and looks around. He runs off and escapes. The guard brings the Calgary Flame players forward. The executioner asks if he has any last requests. He says, no. Good. Ready. Aim. Tornado! Shouts the player. Everyone is startled. Runs for cover. He too escapes. By now the Maple Leaf player has it all figured out. The guard brings him forward, and the executioner asks if he has any last requests. He, too, says no, and the executioner, shout, executioner shouts, ready, aim, fire. <laughs> uh, today, we are going to explore the prophet Jonah and the story of a man who, like our maple leaf, uh, makes a pretty poor decision in the face of a difficult situation. <laughs> Uh, before we get too far in, however, I want to ask the kids of the church uh, if they can help me with something, uh, something that I should have been asking uh, a while ago if I had been thinking straight. Uh, you see, we have a number of bulletin boards in our church foyer, uh, some new, some that have been around for a while, and most of them are empty because there hasn't been a lot happening here. So there's not a lot of posters or information or other stuff up on the walls, and so we've got these empty bulletin boards. And 
Right now, we're in this sermon series on men and women of faith. And as we're looking at men and women of faith, that means we're looking at their stories. And stories make for great pictures, uh, especially a story like Jonah. Uh, or you think of the story of Rahab and the, and the, the rope and the spies running down the wall. Uh, these stories have great images in them. And what I would really like to ask of the kids, uh, those here today, those at home, um, and moms and dads too, if you like to doodle uh, while you listen uh, to a message, uh, would be to draw us some photos, some pictures. Yeah, don't draw a photo. I don't know if you can do that. Draw a picture uh, that we can hang on our bulletin boards. Uh, if we fill the bulletin boards, I'd love to hang them on the glass walls outside the office so the staff can look at your pictures all day. Uh, and you can tell us the things that you're seeing uh, as you're listening to these stories with your family. And then you can persuade mom and dad to either drop the pictures off or mail them in or uh, send them with carrier pigeon, whatever. And uh, we'll put them up and we can all enjoy them over the coming weeks uh, as well. And again, moms and dads, you are welcome to participate if you like. I know that you guys can color too. Okay, now that that is out of the way, I'm going to ask Janice Ledsham if she would come for us today. Uh, Janice is going to read the first chapter of this uh, fishy tale, uh, Jonah, uh, Man on the Run. Uh, as she comes to read for us today, would you please stand as we pay respect to the reading of God's Word? Good morning. I'm reading from Jonah chapter 1. This section's called Jonah Flees from the Lord. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amate. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarsus. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarsus to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind in the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell to Jonah. So they asked him, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord, because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to the land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. The, re the words of the Lord. Let's begin with prayer, shall we? Father, as we look into your word today, as we take a look at this uh, perhaps beloved story, this familiar story, uh, we ask that you might give us your eyes uh, to see the things that you would have us to see. 
You would give us your heart to understand your own. And that you might challenge us, Father. As Austin said at the beginning of the service this morning, would you encourage us, rebuke us, do the work in us that needs to be done as we yield ourselves to you and your word today. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, as we begin our peek into the life of Jonah, and that's really all it's going to be today is a peek. Uh, in fact, if my dad is watching, he's probably horrified at the fact that I'm only going to take one Sunday to preach on Jonah. Um, he has a sermon series uh, that I've heard several times as a pastor's kid uh, where he takes a number of weeks uh, to preach on Jonah, and he likes to often reference the fact that Jonah's been in the belly of the whale for 14 days or so in his series because, well, that's what happens when you only preach every seven days. Uh, but we're going to take one day, uh, we're going to uh, do a high-level overview of this uh, man's life and hopefully learn uh, some lessons from him. Uh, but the one thing that we need to be very clear on, uh, or that you need to understand as far as my perspective when I come to this text today, uh, is that while there are some people who make pretty eloquent arguments for why uh, the book of Jonah, the story of Jonah, is uh, meant to be understood as an allegory or perhaps an extended parable, uh, I... I approach the text and I preach this text at face value. I can't explain how a man can be swallowed by a giant fish, survive in its stomach for three days, and then be, shall we say, delivered up onto dry ground once again. And to be honest with you, I'm not very interested in trying to either. But I believe that the story is true, and one worth taking the time to review and learn from. One of the reasons I believe this story to be more than just a parable or an allegory is the fact that in 2 Kings 14, uh, verse 25 to be specific, uh, Jonah is identified as a real person. Uh, let me read to you beginning at verse 23. In the 15th year of Amazah, son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Jehoahash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. He was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Dead Sea, in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant, Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hefer. Long way of saying Jonah is a real person. Uh, he's referenced outside of the story that bears his name, and we understand uh, that he is the son of Amittai and that he is a prophet. Now, the other reason I take this story to be true uh, in literal is that our Lord Jesus considered Jonah to be a historical person who literally lived in the belly of a fish for three days. Uh, he points to Jonah as a type of his own death, uh, uh, burial, and resurrection. Uh, listen to Jesus' words as recorded in Matthew 12 beginning at verse 38. Jesus said, Then some of, the Pharisees, sorry, some of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. Uh, so before we get into Jonah's life, I think one of the things that we can realize is that when it comes to understanding if Scripture is true, if Jesus says it's true, I think we're on a pretty good standing to understand uh, that the account, the story, is indeed uh, true. Uh, so more than met uh, metaphor, more than allegory, more than parable. So what all this tells us, though, these two passages tell us, is that Jonah, son of Amittai, was a Jewish prophet who ministered in the northern kingdom of Israel. You remember that the nation of Israel was divided into the northern uh, ten tribes and the southern two tribes. It became known as Judah. Uh, he is ministering in the north to the, to the new nation, the smaller nation of Israel during the reign of Jeroboam II, and his reign was approximately uh, 793 to 753 BC. This was a great time of prosperity for this nation. Not only did the nation uh, regain lost territory, as is expressed in 2 Kings, but it expanded. Despite the positive economics, the nation, though, was decaying, both morally 
and spiritually. And they turned from God uh, towards idolatry, the worship of others. The prophet Hosea, who we briefly discussed last Sunday, uh, Hosea, who was asked to marry Gomer, uh, was a contemporary of Jonah's, as was another well-known prophet, Amos. So that's a little bit about Jonah and uh, and the nation of Israel, but what about this city of Nineveh to whom he is sent? Uh, I have a couple of pictures for you. Uh, I told you last week not to get used to it, and then I figured we probably needed another photo today to help you see what we're talking about. So uh, over here, if you're looking on the screen or with me, we have the region of Palestine. We have Israel down here. Uh, You'll see the, uh, the bodies of water that you're familiar with. And way up here, about 500 kilometers uh, to the north and the west, West. or north and the east, is Nineveh uh, in what is modern-day Iraq. Uh, This is, uh, at the time, not the capital of Assyria, but would become the capital of that uh, great and scary nation. Assyria, for those who do not know, was Israel's most dreaded enemy. Their desire, pretty simple, world domination. And they flaunted their power through numerous acts of heartless cruelty. They would place bodies on spikes for passerbyers to see, and they would make necklaces from the skulls of their victims. Returning to Jonah 1, we read that the prophet is being sent because its wickedness has come before me. In other words, God is saying the the stench and the filth from these people, it's it's abusing my nostrils. I can't stand this anymore, and so I'm going to send you. The exact, the exact nature of Nineveh's evil is not mentioned, but does it really need to be? Uh, Nineveh was and remains as infamous as Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, now, there's another prophet. The prophet Nahum was also given a message for Nineveh. This one came, though, about 120 years after Jonah. Uh, Nahum, in chapter 3, verse 19 of the book that bears his name, asks this question. Who has not felt your endless cruelty? Another translation records it as unceasing evil. This is how Nineveh and the nation that it's a part of was seen. In fact, the prophet Nahum provided the background to better understand Jonah's attitude. In fact, sorry, the prophet Nahum provides the background to help us understand Jonah's attitude toward Nineveh when we read, beginning in Nahum chapter 3, verse 1, Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. This oracle against Nineveh goes on to spell out that their sins in Nahum's day, so 120 years later, included plotting against God, exploiting the helpless, prostitution, witchcraft, cruelty in battle, and idolatry. While the text is not explicit, it seems reasonable to understand that these actions were a part of the ethos of Nineveh in Jonah's day, an ethos that people return to less than 100 years later, 100 years after Jonah's ministry. So the stage is set for one of the most spellbinding accounts in the Bible. As Janice read for us, it begins with Jonah being given a mission and a message. Go and preach. What Jonah did was run and hide. He was asked to head east to Nineveh, Instead, he went west to Tarshish. He was asked to bring good news to the Ninevites. Instead, he brought bad news to the sailors. If God asked him to do it, he did the opposite. Now, some wanting to cut Jonah some slack point out that the mission God gave him would be similar to asking a Jewish man or woman to go to Hitler and tell him, Yahweh loves you. However you look at it, though, this man of faith, and he was a man of faith, disobeys, and he disobeys as quickly as he could. The writer of the book, and we are not sure if it's Jonah himself or someone else, stresses the haste with which Jonah traveled. Chapter 1, verse 3 points out that he ran away from the Lord and that he attempted to flee to Tarshish. Now, where is Tarshish? If you take a look again on the map, I'm going to be in the way yet again, uh, you'll see... Uh, Jerusalem and Joppa, which is a port city. Our family had a chance to go to Joppa. And when you look west, you see water. That's it. The Mediterranean Sea is so large that that's all you see on the horizon. 
is vast amounts of water. And so Jonah was asked to go from Israel to Assyria all the way up to Nineveh. Look where he went. Tarshish is pretty much much the far end of the known world. His attempt is to go as far in the opposite direction as a boat will take him. This is not a man who is mildly opposed to what God asks of him. He is an open rebellion. Now, even as I acknowledge Jonah's disobedience, I must acknowledge how often I decide, too, that God is wrong, that he's out to lunch, just flat out crazy, and that my plans are better or make more sense. It's one of the uglier things about me, but I think it's also one of the the more honest statements that I can make today. And so as we stand here and we we take a, a few shots at Jonah and we look at his disobedience and his rebellion, I think we need to begin by acknowledging Uh, that we are not meant to be third parties in this story. That we can see ourselves in the life of this man of faith. That we too have these moments of rebellion, we have these moments of disobedience, where we too decide that what God wants for us is wrong or simply unacceptable, and we look to do other. Some people have said, well, John, uh, Jonah's afraid. Right? You've talked about how terrible Nineveh was, you talked about all of the things that they did, and you talked about the fact that he was told to go there uh, all by his little old lonesome. The guy's afraid, he's scared. Like, isn't that reasonable? Like, let's cut the guy some slack. But the truth of the matter is, and the, and the scripture makes this very apparent to us, is that Jonah is not afraid. He is not running in fear. That we could perhaps uh, tolerate, or understand if not tolerate. Jonah is is being defiant. If you want to take your Bibles and turn to chapter 4, we're going to jump kind of the end of the story to understand the beginning of the story. Um, Jonah, uh, just to fill in the middle spots, uh, he is asked to be thrown overboard. Uh, He is drowning. He's wrapped in seaweed. He's swallowed by a fish. Uh, He spends three days in conversation with God in the belly of this beast and then is burped up on the beach, travels to Nineveh, with God's message. The people immediately accept it, repent, cover themselves in sackcloth. In response, God relents from the impending doom that he had promised. In chapter 3, verse 10, we read, when God saw what they did did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Jonah, Jonah, has just become the most successful evangelist in the world, having convinced an entire city, uh, over 120,000 people, to repent and turn to God, and they all did. The scriptures talk about the joy in heaven when one sinner repents, so it's safe to say that this is a special day in the history books. And Jonah's response to all this? Is he pleased? Is he excited? Is he joining in the celebration of heaven? After all, we do see that he has this conversion experience in the belly of the fish. Sadly, his response is one of anger. His belly of the fish experience was clearly less about getting his heart on the same page as the Father's and more about submitting to the plan and the will of God. Now that's a step, that's a step we appreciate, but it still leaves him standing as the elder brother rather than the repentant son or the prodigal father. He does what God wants him to do, but not with the heart that the Father himself has for the people of Nineveh. To see what I mean, let's look at Jonah 4, verses 1 and 2, which records Jonah's temper tantrum and his motivation for running away in the first place. Here we read, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This, that is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. He's not, he's not afraid. He's convinced that God is wrong. He says, he continues, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. How dare he? Jonah had grown up in a nation that hated Assyria. 
And this hatred had seeped into his very soul. His hatred was so strong that he didn't want them to receive God's mercy. And this is not on him alone, but is representative of the entire nation. You see, Israel had become reluctant to share the good news of God's love with others. Even though Genesis 12 identifies that this is a part of the very purpose of the nation's acceptance. God says to Abraham, he says, I I choose you, I bless you, so that through you all nations will be blessed. And in time, essentially, Israel said, thank you very much, we will accept the blessing and we're going to hold on to it with a tight fist because frankly we don't want anyone else to have it. We may kind of want others to have it. We may even kind of want to want others to maybe have it. But the fact is, is that we hold up this idea that we are the children of God and nobody else is. They were asked to be a vehicle for God's blessing. And they apparently, including Jonah, did not want non-Jews especially Assyrian non-Jews, to learn of and receive God's grace and mercy. But let's listen to the entirety of Jonah's last recorded conversation with God, starting again at 4.1. So again we read, But to Jonah this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home, that it is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish? I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? about the plant. It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? I find myself thinking that the story would be, would be funny if it wasn't so sad. First, Jonah wants to die because God shows mercy rather than destruction. Then when God destroys the vine that had been providing him comfort, he says the same thing. It would be better for me to die than to live. Parents, you've probably had some of these moments where you do one thing and your kid gets upset, and so you, you okay, you want to appease, okay, ooh, relax, all right, okay, we're going to do this, and now they're mad about the other thing. It's like, I can't win. I just can't win. What's going on with this kid? And I imagine God kind of having this conversation with Jonah, or in his head about Jonah. He's like, I, I, I can't win with this guy. I show mercy, he's angry. I destroy, he's angry. What's the deal? Jonah's earlier trip towards Tarshish demonstrated that he was in full-on opposition to God's plan to extend mercy and grace to his enemy. It had been his way of saying, I'm out. Get yourself another patsy. I won't be party to this garbage. This may sound harsh, and you may be still wanting to defend Jonah, but God's word is clear that he was in opposition to what God wanted. Because God was planning to show love to Jonah's enemy, he was turning himself into an enemy of God. And the irony is painful to see. He let his nationalism get the better of him. More concerned about uh, Israel uh, and her benefit than Nineveh, than Assyria, and those who were lost and facing impending doom. As we identified earlier, Israel was prospering at this time and had recently enlarged her borders. But it is likely true that Jonah could see certain doom for his nation 
if this offer of mercy to Nineveh and, by extension, Assyria was given. You're going to be gracious to them. You're going to have compassion on them. You're going to forgive them. They're going to accept it. And then they're going to come and get us. Just destroy them, Lord. Just do it. Get rid of them. They're my enemy. And so what Jonah ends up doing is he declines to fulfill the role of prophet that was given to him by God. Uh, Now, Walter Brueggemann, in his book, The Prophetic Imagination, expands the role of prophet beyond the classic understanding of foretelling and forthtelling that we often have, have learned to understand. He argues that the office of prophet includes these two tasks of foretelling, uh, which is the idea that uh, there are times when we speak of things that are going to happen, uh, the, the God that, uh, a gift that God would have given to those with, with that gifting, uh, that they could speak of what is to come, but also forthtelling, of speaking God's word to the people, of saying the hard things that need to be said. But what he suggests is that really the office was about prophetic criticizing and energizing. Criticism uh, to wake people up from the numbing effect of society and its siren song that this is it, that this is what life is all about. This is all that matters. Uh, The idea is to drag them from their reverie, to drag us from our reverie, and remind us of a kingdom and a king that is so much more. It often comes across in painful ways. Energizing refers to the offering of hope, to explaining that new beginnings are possible, and to the banishment of despair because of what God has done or will do. If we look to Jesus, we can see how he fulfilled the role of a prophet when he criticized the religious leaders of his day and energized the people as he offered them hope in the shape of the kingdom of God. This was done through his actions and his words, and the result is that despair has lost its teeth, For while we may face adversity now, those in Christ have new life. And this is the very thing that Jonah did not want to share with Nineveh. Criticize? Sure, I can criticize. Energize? No, no way. How about vaporize? If at all possible, let's just vaporize. But because this was not an option, he took off, he hopped a ship. The thing Jonah didn't get, or chose not to get, was the fact that while God uses his wrath, his judgment, and perhaps pain in order to refine us, uh, to wake us up, to get our attention, his desire is to be merciful and show compassion. Because this, friends, is the very nature of God. Compassionate and merciful. God, it seems, was most eager for Nineveh and his servant Jonah to learn this lesson. Perhaps our homework this week is to place ourselves in Jonah's shoes and ask ourselves some hard questions to see if this is a lesson we have truly learned and are living out in our daily lives here and now, or whether it's one we have merely heard and filed away. Compassionate? Yeah, yeah, I know God's compassionate. Merciful? Yeah, yeah, I know he's compassionate. He's merciful. Am I okay with him being compassionate and merciful to those who I feel are enemy, to those who are other, to those who act differently, to those who even maybe attack and harm me? So what do we learn from Jonah? Uh, Well, I think that each of us uh, needs to recognize that we are susceptible to moments of distrust, if not outright rebellion. Distrust of God's plan, distrust of God's goodness, distrust of his loving faithfulness. The story of Jonah can stand as a warning to us that we need to always remain connected to the vine, remain close to the heart of the Father. We do this by pursuing his son Jesus, in whom, Colossians tells us, all the fullness of God dwells. But what about the character of God? It's really what I'm hoping that we're going to see each week as we look into the lives or through the lives of these men and women of faith is is what what does these stories, what does this life, what does this text tell us about the character of God? First and foremost, we are brought face to face with God's compassion for those outside our tribe, that is, outside the kingdom, even those we might think of as enemy. 
I've mentioned this before, and I'll say it again. Way back in Genesis 12, God had called the children of Israel to be a blessing to the Gentiles. But they, like Jonah, refused to obey. This call remains for the children of God, for you and I today. To be a blessing to the world and those not yet a part of the church. And we need to decide if we are going to obey or not. Are we going to participate in what God is doing? Or are we going to look to jump a ship and get as far away as we can? Secondly, this story, this book, reiterates and magnifies the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign and he is in control. Despite Jonah's pouting and tantrums and plans to run away, God's purposes were accomplished. Perhaps in a more dramatic way than we see in our daily lives. But his will was not thwarted. We don't know why God determined that it had to be Jonah who went, but it is clear that the plan included this son of Amittai rather than another prophet. And so while Jonah thought that he could uh, either cause God to have to go another route or use another person or do it a different way, because Jonah was smart, Jonah, Jonah knew that God would still do what he was going to do, he just wanted nothing to do with it. And God said, yes, you will. And so we're reminded of God's compassion, we're reminded of God's sovereignty. But also we're reminded of God's patience and his mercy towards us. If he is compassionate and has a heart for the lost, for those who are not yet a part of his, his kingdom, how much more so does he have patience with Jonah, with us, and mercy towards his petulant and disobedient servants? That's you and I. Rather than permitting the ship to sail without him or causing it to sink in the harbor, God patiently waited as Jonah came to the end of himself. And then when the consequences of his actions pointed towards death, God has mercy. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see mercy boiling over again and again through this text. Mercy with the sailors, mercy with Jonah, mercy with Nineveh. In Jonah's words, you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. As we move into this new week that stretches out in front of us, I want to ask you to consider spending some time with three questions that bubble up again and again as I ponder this story. Question number one, am I refusing to cooperate with the Missio Dei, the mission of God, in some way? Am I refusing to cooperate with the mission of God? If so, why? Is it fear? Rebellion? Something else entirely. Question number two. Who am I opposed to loving? What person or group of people do I struggle to show mercy towards? Who am I opposed to loving? What person or group do I struggle to show mercy to? And question number three, how well am I reflecting God's gracious compassion and abounding love? Through my speech, through my actions, to those I encounter. How well am I reflecting God's gracious compassion and abounding love? There's a song we don't sing much anymore, a chorus uh, called Take My Life. Um, The chorus of that song, though, may just serve as our closing prayer this week. The words go something like this. So take my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my will, conform it. To yours, to yours, O Lord. Jonah was a man who had faith in God, complete faith that he was going to be merciful. But he rebelled against that mercy and that compassion because it was not what he desired. The life of Jonah reminds us that we, even as the children of God who understands that God's compassion is for the world, need to check ourselves 
when we have those moments when we say, I, I don't want to be a part of that. If you want to do something neat and great, if you want to reach into these people, if you want to bring a revival, if you want to uh, bring people to faith, that's a wonderful thing, but I just don't think I want to be a part of that because it's scary, it's hard, it seems to go against everything that I, uh, I think is right. And so we pray, take my heart and form it. Take my mind, transform it. Take my will, conform it to yours, to yours, O Lord. Father, we thank you for your servant Jonah. We thank you that this story, this remarkable story, was captured and recorded in your inspired word. Father, thank you that not only can we learn through the, the, the amazing moments in the lives of men and women of faith, Ruth's faithfulness and willingness to journey with Naomi, Stephen standing strong as he faced stoning and death, but that we can also learn through uh, those people who loved you and had faith in you and yet made some terrible decisions. Thank you also that through this story we can see your heart and your character again and be reminded of uh, your compassion, your patience, your mercy, but also to be reminded of your sovereignty and that your plans will not be thwarted by our failures. Thank you for asking us to participate in what it is that you're doing in the world. Help us to be people who can cooperate with what you're doing. May we not just be willing to do the things you want done, but may we be willing to take on your heart, your heart of love. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we have one final song for you before our benediction, so I'll get song here. Um, from a kid's book that we had. All right, before we sing our last song here, um, from a kid's book that we had from a, long, a lot of years ago, there's a prayer that really goes well with this. And so let's pray together. Oh God, you are great beyond our understanding. You brought the world into being by your command. You have always been and will always be. You alone are uncreated and self-sufficient and everything depends on you. You fill the universe and yet you live in each of our hearts. All that is good and right comes from you and you alone are holy. You know us inside and out, including all our sin, and yet you love us unconditionally. You love us so much that you came into the world and died for our sins to save us. We do not deserve such love. We worship and adore you, our great God. We give you our lives, all that we are and have to you. Receive our praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
able to resist the singing as you listen to that this morning? How great is our God. Uh, would you stand for the benediction, please, as we go into our week? Uh, as you go, uh, whether it's to the parking lot to visit or off into activities or to prepare for the service that's happening this afternoon, I do pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you. Uh, that the Lord uh, would shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. That the Lord would turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Grace and peace to you, my friends, as you go into your week. God bless you.